Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Leading Through the Pandemic Virtual Summit. I'm Kaylee O'Keefe. I am the founder of Soul Excellence Publishing, and I am so excited to be kicking off our author conversations with Brendan Daly, COO of Wowza Media Systems. Brendan, welcome. Kaylee, thank you. Uh, this is a really cool experience. I'm very excited. Uh, I also recently found out that I'm the first one going today, so uh, <laughs> hopefully we set the tone right with that, but thanks for having me. Yeah, so, so excited to connect with you first and just let us know where are you joining us from? And I like to do a weather report this time of year just to know what's going on in the world. So where are you based? I'm based about 15 miles west of Denver, Colorado. So any of you all who are uh, who love concerts, Red Rocks is a famous concert venue. I can see that from uh, from my driveway. So it's uh, it's quite sunny, blue sky out today, but I don't have any idea if it's warm or cold. You know, Denver this time of year, I could walk outside, it could be 60, it could be about 30. Uh, so I think we're supposed to get snow this week. I'll guess it's probably around 40 today. Oh, I love it. All right. Well, and are Red Rocks, are they doing any concerts yet? Or what's the status of, of venues out where you are? Um, so they haven't done any concerts recently. They are booking tickets for this upcoming uh, event season uh, in this summer and fall. So I think they're pretty bullish on things opening back up enough for that to work. Um, but, you know, as far as I'm aware, the actual venues remained open for people to go. Uh, so it's a common workout place. So people love yep. to go run the steps. <laughs> I've done that once on a trip out to Denver. And it's funny you talk about future bookings. I did hear on the radio over the weekend uh, that the weekend is coming to South Florida in March of 2022. And I just thought like, that is so far away mentally. Like I, who can commit? Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, let's, let's talk about you. Let's talk about your chapter, your leadership lessons, kind of how you've grown across 2020. Cause it was such a big year for you professionally and personally but let's just start with telling us a little bit more about you and your role and what the heck does Wowza Media Systems do? That's a great question. So I, I'm our chief operating officer. Uh, I have a little bit of a different scope of responsibility than COOs in some organizations. So I see oversee all of our go-to-market functions, including sales and marketing, uh, business operations, our customer success group, our customer support group, and our professional services group. Um, Wowza Media Systems is a 15-year-old company. They were actually founded out here in Colorado. Our office is just up the hill from Red Rocks, actually. If, you, uh, if you've ever frequented the uh, I-70 corridor to get out to uh, the ski mountains, there's a, there's a place out there where you'll see a herd of buffalo. And our office is actually right next to that famous buffalo herd. I think the herd is there to uh, commemorate uh, Buffalo Bill and some of his exploits uh, you know, over 100 years ago. <laughs> Um, oh, I, I love it. And you, um, as we'll, we'll explore in your chapter, but you, I would say you, you recently joined Wowza, correct? Exactly. Yeah. December of 2019, I had started wow. and that was uh, two weeks after leaving my prior employer and after my daughter was born as well. So very eventful uh, few weeks for me there. <laughs> so let's dig into uh, to your chapter because it really does start with this like 2020 is going to be your year, like new dad, new job, like things are amazing. So just walk us through what you what you wrote about in your chapter. That's great. Yeah. So I kind of broke it up uh, into four smaller subsections, but the first two were really focused on uh, starting off by understanding the difference between leadership and management. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one of those things that several of us end up in positions of managerial responsibility, um, but don't take a lot of time, uh, at least at first, to think about what the difference between being a manager and a leader is. And so I start off with a little bit of reflection there personally about you know, what the difference means to me and then what I was looking for as that next step in my career. And then kind of pivot into the discussion of you know, why I came to Wowza in the first place, all about sort of pivoting our company strategy to more of a customer relationship focused strategy and really uh, engaging with our customers and understanding the value of the solutions that we provide uh, both to their business and their employees, but also their end customers. So at Wowza, we provide a scale scalable live streaming video architecture that actually gets embedded in several different solutions that people interact with today. Uh, we offer both cloud versions and server-based versions and have been incredibly successful at that over the last 15 years. But oftentimes we didn't know why customers loved us, right? Mm -hmm. So we knew that they found great value in our solutions, but we didn't necessarily know um, why they chose us over other organizations and that made it difficult for us to prioritize some of our development activities and what we prioritize in terms of our business. 
Um, so I was brought on board originally as our VP of customer success in December of 19 to build out that customer success team and really start to interact with our customers more directly and understand you know, why Wowza was the right fit for them and what we can do to be that trusted partner for them. So you join this company and, you know, there's big plans for the year. And I think if I, if I think through the stories in the book, yours is one of the company was growing this year. I mean, you're doing online streaming video. We're all on video. So talk to us about what it was like to join the company during a period of growth, but also no longer being in the office, your role morphing a lot. What was that like for you? So for me, the, the hardest part was learning the software in the industry. You know, I came from another SaaS based uh, technology company, but it was an entirely different industry with different acronyms, different uh, configurations, all of these other things that, you know, I'm not necessarily a technical person, but I like to get up to speed enough to be able to hold my own in those conversations. And my original plan was to go on one to two customer business reviews per month throughout the course of 2020 to get on site with our sales engineers and our customer success team to hear all the feedback from customers firsthand. And I gotten through two of those meetings uh, right when we shut down travel with COVID. And so that really uh, changed my ability to onboard myself as well as create this new team. Um, you know, we, we quickly pivoted to run these business reviews in a remote context. As you can imagine, in that mid-March to uh, early April timeframe, most people weren't that open to it because uh, they were trying to kind of figure out what their new normal looked like. Uh, but by the time we got to mid to late April, customers opened up and saw that this was probably going to carry on for a little while longer. And we started holding these uh, executive business reviews in a remote uh, in a remote way. I want to jump back um, in just a minute to the the management to leadership shift because I think that's super important for so many of the leaders who are going to be watching this video and and hearing from you. But before I do, when you talk about customer success and and helping your team feel a sense of purpose, what were some of the things that you did to once you recognized okay we're 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 customer centric kind of, but how do we bring that in more? And how important was that to you keeping up team morale and focus throughout the year? I'm a big fan of this concept called customer journey mapping, yeah. where you you basically, you're not just talking to your customers about the core product itself, but about their experiences across all parts of the customer journey. So as they're learning about your solution, as they're buying it, as they're receiving it, whether that is you know simply, hey, here are your keys or your login, or whether we're driving a professional services engagement to work with them, as they use it on an ongoing basis. And then finally, as they're getting support uh, throughout that life cycle, and that becomes very circular, they, you know, they continue through that process throughout. So getting feedback about, you know, we, we had several customers that would say, we love the solution, but you could do a lot better in this part of the journey cycle, right? You know, you, uh, the pricing me uh, methodology is a little bit confusing on your website. So maybe you all could change those things. Or, you know, we get six emails the second we sign up for something from you all is there a way that we can make that a better experience? And sharing that feedback in a very direct fashion with the group and, and relating it to people's personal experiences, I think has a real impact. You know, we are a B2B company, but we all interact with, uh, with purchasing in our own consumer lives. Mm -hmm. So the more you can tie the experiences that we provide, good or bad, to uh, corollaries in people's uh, direct B2C type purchasing, the more they understand the impact of those and how they can improve them for their customers. And you um you really brought that into the company this year. And you know, one of the stories that resonates from your chapters, uh, I think it was your was a Q3 or Q2 company all hands where yep. bringing bringing the customer stories to life and I I love for you to share that story and as I told you it's one where my dad was reading your chapter, he works in a small more like manufacturing based company is like wait a second, how do we tie together the purpose that we're serving with the needs of our customers more in a more um accessible way. So I would love to hear how you did that this year. Yeah, that's a great question. So historically, you know, every every quarter and a lot of businesses do this, we would show the big logo slide, mm -hmm. right? You know, who are the new large logos that bought Wowza? Great, right? It's exciting. Uh, it, it usually means something good for your financials. But if you don't understand, you know, why they chose you, how they use you and what value you provide for their organization and their end customers, then you really lose connect connectivity to that purpose. And so at the end of our Q2 all hands uh, last year in 2020, we spot, did a spotlight on four different customers across different industries. And we talked about, you know, we've all heard these names. We've seen them on the big logos before, but why did they choose Wowza? And what in particular do we do for them? 
And some of these stories really hit home for our employees, right? I mean, one of the organizations we work with builds out these custom NICU monitoring solutions uh, for third world countries. And they historically had done it through the, the monitoring of heartbeat, blood pressure, you know, several other uh, items like that. And then the data was sent back to doctors in other, in other countries to provide feedback on alternative treatments. But the doctors kept complaining that without seeing the patient, they couldn't provide a very accurate uh, diagnosis. And so we added that video layer to that solution and it really changed the effectiveness of that. So, you know, everybody who worked on the professional services engagement uh, for that, all of our sales engineers who scoped the solution took an immense sense of pride in knowing that something they put together is literally helping save lives. Uh, similarly, another organization was a, a large e, uh, trade show event producer, right? And obviously trade shows did not really happen in 2020. Mm -hmm. And so you think about, you know, that's however many uh, employees and families of that organization that are at risk of losing their jobs and the impact of that, you know, across their lives, we were able to help them pivot to put on remote trade shows in a very effective fashion, both in terms of a great experience, but also, you know, scalability and reach in a global fashion. And so it was able to help them pivot their business and survive, which at the end of the day, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of employees and families and whatnot got to keep jobs because of the work we helped do. That's an incredibly motivating uh, story to tell our employee base. How did employees respond to hearing to those stories? Like, do you notice a discernible uptick in creativity or engagement or like what happens when you're able to really express the impact that you're having on customers' lives? It, you know, it's sort of full circle, right? On one end, on the sales side, it, it makes the sales reps and sales engineers even more curious to understand the solutions that they are providing early on in the cycle and the value it provides. Right. And then our customer success organization, as they as those customers get handed off to them once they're live, they really take that to heart. They say, you know, the, the whole reason this comp this company bought Wowza was to, you know, build this NICU monitoring solution. Right. Or do a live uh, testing and proctoring solution uh, in a remote world. And understanding that core value is something they, they want to make sure that we never break that trust. Right. Uh, you know, uptime means something different to each of these organizations. If if your solution fails, it could mean health risks for you know newborns, or it could mean that you know these these highly paid uh, trade show events that uh, other businesses rely on for marketing income are you know losing money for them, and that impact is real for everyone. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking back to my time in corporate and my my logo slides and my stories and. Yeah, I think it's it's sort of seeing the light in people's eyes of like getting re-energized, re-motivated, increasing curiosity. And it's I think that curiosity factor is just in a year where a lot of us had to put blinders on and tune out information, reimagining and exposing ourselves to being more curious and therefore creative is at least one of my hopes going into the next year that we, we tap back into that energy. Absolutely. So I think, I mean, as I've gotten to know you throughout the writing process or hearing your story again on this interview, I mean, you come across, right, as this cool, calm, collected leader, which you are. And so I want to ask you, like, what was the hardest part about leading in 2020 for you personally? You had a lot to learn. You were in a kind of good, you know, team position, et cetera. But what, what was really challenging for you? Uh, I think the toughest part, you know, being still pretty new to the organization, I was only in the office for about two and a half, three months before uh, we dispersed. It was, it was missing that collaboration and, and group work in, a phys in the same sort of physical environment together with my new teammates uh, that would have helped both transition our strategy a little bit faster, mm -hmm. as well as for me get a better working relationship with my team. You know, I, uh, I had one of my employees, one of my direct reports who I didn't actually meet until November of 2020. So I'd worked with him for 11 months and I'd never seen him in person. And you know, I told him, hey, if you walk through the door and you're like seven and a half feet tall, I'm going to be really confused because I've only <laughs> ever seen you sitting down in the same chair for the last 11 months. It's uh, it's funny to hear you say that. I had worked for a company last year for, for a few months and I started the same day as a co-manager. The company's called Assurance based out of Seattle. We were building out the Florida base. You know, my co-manager, we started together. We worked super closely together for three months, but entirely remotely, had never met in person. And just last week, we met up in Miami for the first time. And it it was kind of like that first date feeling where you're like, okay, I've seen your head, you know, but like, what? how tall are you? What do you look like? What's your style? Um, yeah, so it's nice that we're able to uh, put a, a virtual face to a, <laughs> to a colleague in person. 
All right. In the backdrop of all this, and as you share in your chapter, you are a new dad and working from home. Uh, I believe your wife's also working for, yep. for most of this year too. So, and you and you make a parallel in your chapter of moving from manager to leader and father to dad. So, tell us more about what that means to you. Yeah. So, you know, the difference between management and leadership and, and dad and father is is sort of one title is is granted. You know, based on an event, right? You're a manager when you have people reporting to you, right? You are a father when you have a child, right? But earning the title of dad or earning the title of leader is something you have to to work for, and it's based on your accomplishments over time, not just a, a power or a title that's been given to you. Um, so the dad one has been a lot of fun. You know, we throughout 2020 we had some some interesting times. My wife uh, went back to work uh, in mid April, but she's working full time remote as well. But you know, throughout the year, we had a, uh, our daughter's been in daycare. Uh, our daycares thankfully didn't close, but every now and then along the way, you know, we had some scares where uh, she'd come home with a runny nose and you know a little bit of a fever, and you know, it ended up being teething. But we had to keep her home for a week <laughs> and uh, lock. Uh -huh. You know, if you're wondering why I have these gates behind me, it's because I had to lock her in my little work area with me here for a week until we got you know her COVID test back, and then you know, so it, it definitely added uh, a strange uh, dynamic to. The complexities of working from home. You know, she's uh, she's 14 months old now, and uh, we would not be able to work if she was home full day because she is a running, crawling, jumping machine. <laughs> well, and a ray of sunshine. Like when she was on the one call we did for a little bit, like it changes yep. the vibe, the mood. But yeah, very energetic. So <laughs> she loves to photo bomb Zoom every now and then. So on, on some of our late afternoon uh, leadership meetings, I'll I'll bring her onto the camera, and she gets her face right up to the screen as close as possible, and, uh, and really enjoys it. <laughs> oh, I love, um, yeah, no, I, it has been very interesting to see how everyone's navigated that at home dynamic and it'll, it'll be the topic of the next book that we're going to produce at Soul Excellence Publishing that I'll, I'll share at the end. So let's see where we've started this year and it's kind of felt different for everyone for different reasons. What do you want to carry into the future from your experience last year? And like, what do you want to just ditch <laughs> or say like, no, we're going to stop this. But I want to keep doing that based on what happened and, and your own growth as a leader. I really appreciated the the flexibility that the entire organization demonstrated at Wowza in terms of adapting to this new process and this new normal. And, you know, we work in a fast paced tech company. So that's always, you know, change is, is the is the only constant. Right. So um, that's one of those things that, that I look forward to us carrying forward. You know, we, we adopted new tools, new processes, uh, new cadences for you know meetings that we had typically had in person, and and we didn't lose a step along the way. In fact, some of the places we actually got better because people took more work to prepare beforehand or had tighter meeting agendas. Right, we were more conscious of each other's time. You know, people weren't showing up late to Zoom meetings and sort of uh, you know cascading being late through all of their meetings throughout the day. So I think that went a long way. Um, that's something I'd love to see carry forward yeah. throughout the, uh, you know, going forward, um, as well as our ability to tether what motivates our organization. You know, once we had, uh, we actually officially rolled out our brand promise and brand purpose at our company kickoff meeting in January of this year. So we had talked about them conceptually in prior quarters, but we did a grand unveiling of them and a, and a full dissection of what a promise is versus a brand purpose and how we came up with that. and. You know, our, our big goal throughout the course of this year is recall and activation. So we rolled out new uh, Zoom backgrounds where if we were on a Zoom meeting right now, you would see my background would have our company purpose as well as our brand promise on it, uh, desktop backgrounds, and then revised our email signatures to help really get that, um, you know, saturated across all of our, our touch points and something that, you know, three months from now, I should be able to walk up to anybody in our organization and ask them what's our brand purpose and what's our brand promise and be able to you know rattle it off at the top of their head what, what is the distinction between brand purpose and brand promise so purpose is usually something that's a little bit more internal um you know it's a rallying cause that you use for your internal teams uh it's a little bit it's it's usually less specific around what you actually do right so that i use that at united airlines example that's one of my favorite ones uh in, in my chapter they don't talk about you know the fastest flights or if it's late it's free or any of those types of things that would be more of a brand promise. Their brand purpose yeah, is, right. uh, I believe it's uniting people and connecting the world, or I might've gotten that one backwards. Um, but you know, they, they really speak to why do they exist? And, and that's what they do. They bring people together. 
And so for, you know, the brand promise is something that usually could have a, a guarantee on the box, so to speak, right? So that's one of those, you know, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance, right? If it's, if your food's not there in five, in 15 minutes from when you order, it's free. Uh, that Those types of things where you're saying this is one of the most important parts of, of the experience we deliver and we're going to stand behind it with some sort of guarantee. Got it. And what, so what, um, what is Wells's brand purpose? Uh, okay. You want brand purpose or brand promise? <laughs> purpose. Yeah. That more like intangible feeling one. Uh, powering connections to engage your world. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. Our focus there was to not, you know, focus it solely on live streaming, um, but also really, you know, what do we do? We, we are a sort of this platform infrastructure layer that underpins a lot of the video solutions that people interact with. So that concept of powering those for those other organizations was really important to us. Uh, you know, similar to United, we, we drive connections, right? And those connections could be between one to one person. It could be between, be between one person and 10,000. Or we actually have situations where uh, we call it robots watching TV, but it's where AI or ML is watching video and analyzing it. And so that we are still driving that connection. And then it's all about engaging. Uh, we wanted to make it specifically your world, right? Whether that's you know, your local high school football game or whether that's uh, you know, the entire world or a, a specific demographic you're going after, uh, that was really important to us. It's funny you mentioned uh, your local high school football game. As you know, I've returned to South Florida. I now live near my high school, and they also happen to be the very best football team in the entire country, St. Thomas Aquinas. And, like, I was so bummed to not be able to go to a game this year. <laughs> and I'm like, fingers crossed for next year. I'm going to be that, you know, alumni returnee that's, like, all about it <laughs> now that I'm back home. <laughs> um, before, um, before we wrap up, and I, I want to read one quote from your chapter. Um, well, let me do that. And then I'm going to ask you just to, to share with us as we wrap up your, maybe just one thing, you know, for people that you want people to take away from reading, from reading your chapter. But I wanted to share on, on part four of your chapter, you write, leading through a pandemic is different than managing through one and both facets are necessary to succeed. Managing through a pandemic or any other large scale challenge involves tactical shifts to ensure continuity of operations go on. Leading through a pandemic means understanding how these challenges impact our teams and providing a unifying sense of purpose to rally behind. In a sense, less is more. And I just, I love that line. I love that distinction. And the less is more. And as a leader, recognizing we have the power to focus our attention and focus the organization's attention and recognizing not everything is an emergency or not everything warrants the same level of attention. And so that, that distinction of providing understanding and a sense of purpose, just, I think beautifully sums up the work that you're doing, what you're bringing to the organization. Um, and a message that as we head into the next year, couldn't be, couldn't be said enough. Well, thank you. appreciate that. <laughs> you're welcome. What, what do you want uh, readers to take away from your chapter? At the end of the day, it's all about impact, you know, particularly, uh, you know, last year wasn't just about a pandemic, right? There were several other uh, you know, social happenings that, that went on that ne that negatively impact a lot of people's lives. And it, it made it very difficult for people to cope with all of the other stressors in life, personal, professional, uh, you know, macro and microeconomic, all of those things. And, and so at the end of the day, I think it becomes really difficult to say, what can I as one person do? Uh, when things feel this discombobulated, this out of control, mm -hmm. like it's it's that much bigger than me. And and it, when you can figure out where that impact ties, you know, me as one employee at, at a business, what what is my role and how does it contribute to my organization? And what is that organization's impact on the world? You know, er every company provides a service or a product or something of value uh, that impacts other families and people and, you know, uh, and businesses across the world. And so, the more you can tie back each individual's contribution to that impact, the more you can help them make sense of any difficult situation, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's, you know, some sort of uh, events of nature, right? You know, anything like that. So I think that's probably the most important takeaway for me. I love it. And 
If you haven't picked up your copy yet to read Brendan's chapter, you can ebook it or the paperback is now available. Uh, if you know Brendan, get him to sign a copy for you. <laughs> Brendan, I want to thank you so much and um, just maybe leave us with this of why was it important for you to share your story in this book at this moment? Uh, two reasons. The first was to challenge myself. You know, uh, it's, it's, this was never an initiative that I had uh, on my on my life plan or my career plan. But when it came up, it became very obvious that it was something that I kind of felt compelled that I had to do for myself. Mm. Um, but outside of that, you know, I think it was just it's a great experience to be able to compare your thoughts against the thoughts of others as they go through challenges. And, you know, throughout this book, there are going to be several chapters that resonate with people and there's going to be some that won't. But it's all great perspective. Uh, to sort of keep in your mind as a tool set as you move forward. So true. And yeah, it doesn't surprise me to hear you say, yep, I just saw, I saw a challenge and I wanted to, <laughs> to tackle it. <laughs> I love that mindset. And it's just been a pleasure getting to work with you and to see, to read your chapter and, um, you know, just the impact I know that it's having on people's lives. So, so thank you for sharing your wisdom with us, Brendan. It was great. Thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Brendan, for kicking off this summit. We've got more interviews coming up later today and the rest of the week. And if you're also interested in participating in our next multi-author book, uh, Liftoff, How to Lead Your Team Through a Product Launch or Lockdown, How to Navigate uh, the School System as a Working Parent from this past year, I'll pop those links in if you're interested in applying. Brendan, thank you again. And we'll see everyone on the next interview. Thank you.